So, uh, bonjour tout le monde. Good day, everyone. I am David Bodwick, Executive Director of Green Marine. Welcome to this fourth Green Tech webinar. I hope you had the opportunity to rest and recharge your batteries during the summer months. We certainly all needed that to be in good shape to face the last part of this uh, very challenging year 2020. Hopefully our three September webinars will help you start on the right foot. The first three webinars in June were very popular, more than we expected actually. Uh, so despite the cancellation of our usual in-person event in June, we're very proud to be able to present this uh, virtual alternative with the same high quality content you are used to and free of charge. And for that, we owe a lot to our 14 amazing sponsors. Thank you to all of them and a very special thank you to our gold sponsors. Fednav, Groupe de Gagny, the Two St. Lawrence Seaway Corporations and Camfornav. So the webinar today will focus on different environmental initiatives in three Green Marine certified ports and terminals. It will be moderated by my esteemed colleague, Veronique Trudeau, our St. Lawrence program manager. So on that quick note, I give her the floor and wish you all a great webinar. Thank you, David, and thanks everyone for being with us today. So all attendees and speakers, uh, it's very nice to have you uh, with us today for this uh, fourth webinar the f and the first one of the September series. So uh, just a few words before we actually start the presentations. Um, I just want to share a few details on how this webinar we will work. Uh, we will have three speakers today uh, giving each a 20 minute presentation. Each presentation will be followed by a five minute question period. So all attendees and even the speakers can actually uh, write their questions in the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen on the toolbar. And Manon Lanty, which is our uh, communications director, will be the facilitator for this uh, session today. She will be behind the scene uh, managing the Q&A uh, box. And so everybody is welcome to ask questions in the Q&A box. Uh, and we actually also invite you to uh, read those questions that are posted during the, the presentation. And you can even upvote your favorite ones by using the like button uh, below the question to steer, that will help us actually steer the discussions uh, after the presentations. And even if uh, we don't have time to answer all the questions in the five minute periods following uh, each presentation, the speakers will actually continue monitoring the Q&A box after their presentation. They can write and type their answers uh, during the webinar. So uh, let's begin right away. Uh, I will introduce you to our first, uh, present, uh, our first speaker, which is Manon Dauteuil from the port of Cécile. Manon is the Director of Engineering and Sustainable Development for the Cécile uh, Port Authority in Quebec. Uh, she has, over the past 24 years, promoted and managed several initiatives and research involving both engineering and the environment, which is quite a task. She is a member of several technical advisory committees at the provincial and federal levels in Canada, including Green Marine's uh, St. Lawrence Advisory Committee that I am coordinating, and she's actually the chair of the committee uh, right now. She has also been involved in various boards of directors of social, educational, and financial organization where she played key roles like being president, secretary, communications officer, uh, among others. So today's presentation given by Manon Dauteuil is entitled Innovative Project, Coming Together to Preserve Ecosystems While Ensuring Sustainable Development. So Manon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Veronique. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you today. So good day, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about our innovative project, which is the implementation of uh, an environmental observatory in the Sitsa industrial port zone and within the port limits. First of all, uh, let me start by pointing out the limits of the port of Sitsa. We are situated uh, on the north shore of the St. Lawrence River in the province of Quebec. We are actually situated on the 50th parallel. The port limits are situated between two major rivers, one of which, the Moise River, is a world-renowned salmon river. The port limits also include the seven islands 
at the entrance of the Bay of Setil. The port boundaries are shown by the dotted line and the observatory was conducted in this whole area. This represents a total area of 240 square kilometers. The bay has an area of 100 square kilometers. The main activities in the Bay of Setil are divided in two distinct sectors. In this urban area, you have the Rio Tinto Iron Ore Company with its private docks. You can also see a petroleum cruise ship and a general cargo dock. There's also a marina, local fish industry, and other public infrastructures. We call this industrial area the Point Noir sector. In this sector, there is Aluminaria Alouette, the biggest aluminum smelter in America with 600,000 tons per year, and also Société Ferroviaire et Portuaire de Pointe Noire, a new operator offering storage and handling capa capabilities for the mining industry. Three different docks service this area, Pointe Noire, La Relance, and the newly built multi-user docks. Now, is the bay healthy? Over the years, there have been a lot of private studies done by various organizations for different reasons. However, after more than 50 years of industrial activities, there were no studies that can evaluate the overall water and sediment condition, as well as the potential impacts and synergic effects on the ecosystem as a whole. To answer this question, we had to set up a major project for us and for the population. Its success depended on partnership. What is needed is a concerted effort to study the present condition of the Bay in all its aspects. In 2012, the Port the Economic Development Corporation and the Environmental Protection Corporation of Setil got together with a common objective of studying the situation. Luckily for us, in the same year, INRES, Institut Nordique de Recherche en Environnement et en Santé au Travail, a reputed independent research group was setting up their organization in the region. This new research institute is focused on research activities in connection with the science of environment, health, and safety. The objective of NRES are to develop innovative applied projects, taking into account the concerns of sustainable development to provide scientific support to decision making and measure the impacts of human activities on ecosystem, the environment, the health of the population, and the safety of workers. Therefore, the Porosito and the city corporations mandated INRES to head the observatory. INRES provided the independent credibility that was needed. It also allowed the region to attract and retain much needed expertise. In 2013 and 2014, the Port of Setil and the City of Setil invested around $385,000 on the first two phases, which provided the preliminary basis of the observatory. This allowed us to choose the subjects and zone on which to concentrate our efforts. Phase one and two gave us a preview of the condition of the bay. However, it left us with more questions than answers. More in-depth field research was necessary. Press one and two guided us to more specific areas where we had to do further research. For example, further sampling and analysis were conducted in first phase three for physical and chemical sediment characterization on the natural concentration of post-glacial clay in the sediment. 
Once finalized, the information gathered showed us the human activity contribution for the different parameters which were studied. In particular, it was interesting to see the footprint that the anthropic activities have had on the Bay Area. In 2016, the Port of Cetil and the City of Cetil invited the big industries of Cetil and the Société du Planar to join the effort. Together, along with an additional $650,000 of investment, we were able to provide a clear picture of the actual state of the bay and a better understanding of its health. In addition to providing an environmental overview, this project seeks to update and consolidate data and metrics on the, bay, on the Bay's environment, produce an annual monitoring report based on data processed by INREST, predict the Bay's capacity to accommodate acceptable projects that will easily integrate our precious ecosystem and be safe for people and the environment help existing businesses improve their environmental performance, measure the results of conservation and environmental improvement efforts in the Bay of Cetil, find indicators to help further monitoring. This important project will enhance understanding of current and future environmental impact thanks to the acquisition of credible and updated baseline data. It will help protect our valuable marine ecosystem and ensure responsible planning based on sustainable values. Our report was, was published in 2018 that included the result of, to, well, pardon me, our final report was published in 2018 that included the result of all three phases, conclusions, and recommendations. All the data collected from 2013 to 2017 are presented in the report that we published in a book form. The report, volume one, is available on the INRES Port and City of Seattle website. In addition, Detailed data is, pretend, is presented in volume two. INRES has established partnership with various scientific collaborators to conduct studies related to the observatory of the Bay of Cetil. The main collaborators are Observatoire Global du Saint-Laurent, l'Université du Québec à Rimouski, l'Institut des sciences de la mer de Rimouski, Québec Océan, l'Université Laval, and Expertise Marine at the University of Quebec, Ashkuti. The following subjects were selected in this study. Water quality, including physical and chemical and microbiological evaluation. Sediment quality, including physical, chemical analysis and granulometry. Benthic community, eelgrass and malto-algae, alga. Also, a literature survey of existing data related to sea current and ice cover was conducted. The new observatory also integrates the objective pursued by Green Marine. It is worth mentioning that the Port of Cetil was the first and the only port to reach 100 of its users as Green Marine participant. The city of Cetil has been and still a supporter of this voluntary improvement program. A good one, by the way. In conclusion, the overall quality of the environment is good based on the team's knowledge at the time the report was written and the portrait of the Bentic community, characterization of egress beds, overview of the microalgae alga community in the subtitle zone, marine mammal survey and monitoring program, as well as the presence of fish, seabirds, crustacean, and other species, combined with the result collected in the study of water quality, as well as the study of sediment quality, testify to the good quality of the environment as a whole. However, in order to maintain the quality of the environment and ecosystem, 
a series of recommendations are presented in the report. The next step will be to develop indicators to ensure a rigorous follow-up of the health of the bay. To obtain these stressors indicators, the Port of Cetil and the City of Cetil have decided to join the CONI2 project and has committed an investment of a further $1 million through INREST as cash and in-kind contribution. The CONI2 project is sponsored by NSR, NSERC, Canadian Healthy Oceans Network and its partners, Department of Fishery and Ocean Canada, and INREST representing the Port Authority, Port of Cetil, and the City of Cetil. The scope and quality of the knowledge that will be acquired in the Bay of Cetil sector and the North Shore region as a result of this research project, as well as the, as the tools developed, will be important assets for the management of the marine environment to ensure a sustainable development. Lately, the Port of Cetil continue to work on increasing the knowledge of the sector by being involved in different projects. In May 2019, in rest, the Port of Cetil and the City of Cetil were proud to host in Cetil the first international congress on industrial port research called CERCET. The team of the conference was scientific research as a management tool. There were 300 attendees from eight different countries. In February 2020, Université Laval, INRES, and the Port of Cetil announced the launch of the research chair in coastal ecosystem and industrial port and maritime activities. The chair's mission will be to further the knowledge on coastal ecosystem functions in industrial port zones in order to identify practices that will ensure a sustainable management of these environments. This chair is made possible thanks to a 1 million contribution over five years from INRES and the Port of Cetil. In March 2020, the Port of Cetil and INRES uh, we're proud to welcome the Canadian Coast Guard's research icebreaker, Amundsen. The Amundsen carries the Odyssey Saint Laurent Research Program's third winter oceanography mission, collecting advanced data on the St. Lawrence estuary ecosystem in winter. The aim of the program is to add to our knowledge of St. Lawrence ecosystems, their biodiversity. Uh, biodiversity and environmental stress factors affecting them and to develop tools, technologies, and new practices in sustainable marine development. In July 2020, the Port of Cetil and INRES were proud to announce the inauguration of the first research center on industrial port ecosystem, the Center for Industrial Port Expertise, CEIP, a division of INREST. CEIP's mission is to offer services and scientific expertise on the environment and occupational health. Experts and researchers in a variety of, field, of fields provide centralized research and development services and technical support adapted to the specific environmental management and operational challenges of industrial ports areas to managers in the North Shore region and other maritime regions of Quebec, Canada, and abroad. This project was also the result of uh, the long-term financial support provided by big industries partners, the city of Cetil and the port of Cetil, demonstrating the, part, the leadership on regional cooperation that have gone into the CEIP project. The Port of Cetil was also pleased to announce a grant of $250,000 over five years to help INREST develop CEIP. One of the main goals of the Port of Cetil would be to use the newly acquired information to guide decisions related to our present and future activities 
So it's like the Paracetamol Master Plan and Emergency Plan, which will induce bill response. The other goal is to assume our reader, readership role by mobilizing the big industries to also invest in the process since in our statement of mission, partnership is a fundamental value that leads to success. All of which are focused on a continuing sustainable development approach. In conclusion, you can visit our website to find the phase one, two and three reports. Please note that these reports are in French only. However, you will find the press releases and result summaries in both languages. As they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Here's a video presenting the relation, relationship between the port, industrial, and municipal activities in respect with the ecosystem preservation. I will be, I will be back after to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Manon, just to tell you that we have no sound. We have sound now.
I'm, I'm sorry, Manon, I, that we didn't have the sound, but I'll make sure that uh, there's a link in the PDF with the sound. I had sound on my screen when I shared it. So I'll make sure to include it this way. I'm sorry. Right. Luckily for us, there was no uh, wording, just uh, nice music, and we work uh, a lot on it. So uh, it's a shame, but it's okay. <laughs> So Veronique, I'll uh, leave, you, leave it to you for the, uh, the Q&A. Yes. So thank you, Manon, for this great presentation. Uh, there is uh, one question here in the uh, Q&A box, a question from Yves Salon. Can you please tell us how your environmental monitoring and research initiative can help you to adapt to the climate change and maybe sea level rising? Yes, uh, it's a good question for sure. Um, uh, if uh, we want to uh, do something uh, uh, to adapt, we need to uh, understand our uh, uh, place. So that's why we, uh, we did it and it helped us to continue to uh, have more information. And at that moment, we are uh, working on our infrastructure and we, uh, we were able to see what will be the impact. So. And with the knowledge, we are able to do um, a good decision. And, uh, but we, uh, we're not finished. We need to continue. So it's just a, it, it's just a start. But uh, we are working with a lot of uh, um, good researchers. And uh, they help us to understand what will uh, come in our place and also around. Because it's not just good for Settle is also good for the region and also uh, places like us that they have um, uh, the ice conditions and uh, 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 cold weather. Thank you, Manon. Uh, we also have another question from Alexandre Ouellet. Uh, I'll try to translate it as I, as I read it. Uh, is it planned to do this, the same kind of research at a determined frequency to be able to follow up on the deterioration of natural environments? Um, there's no frequency, but it will um, have um, continue, we, we will continue the observatory by uh, using um, uh, more detailed um, characterization because uh, we have a good base now what we need to do is to continue to uh, make a, a survey to, um, I don't know, a suivi, uh, follow-up. So we need to do a follow-up to understand uh, what's going on. But we have the main information. Now we just need to do a follow-up and also uh, see the places where we need more uh, research. We will do it. But uh, yeah, for sure. We will continue. Thank you. There's uh, two more questions in the Q&A box, but since it's already 2.30, I'll let Manon Dauteuil uh, answer them. Uh, she will type answers for those questions. So I think that we should move on to our... Uh, thank you, Manon. Thank you very much for this uh, great presentation. And uh, we will move on to our next presentation right away, which will be given by Andrew McKay from EnviroChem. So Andrew is a senior manager and partner at Enviro EnviroChem Services in North Vancouver, and, uh, which is also a green marine partner. Uh, he leads a practice that specializes in marine construction environmental management from capital dredging to facility expansions. Uh, with more than 25 years of related, related experience, he has learned the importance of industry-driven programs such as green marine that supports a strong marine sector while adapting to changing environmental and social conditions. Uh, today's presentation uh, given by Andrew McKay is entitled Mission Impossible, Capital Dredging and Habitat Restoration at Pacific Coast Terminal. So Andrew, the floor is yours. Good morning, good, good afternoon everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone. I wanna make sure um, I know that you can see my screen. Uh, not yet. You have to share your screen and choose the, the right uh, PowerPoint uh, that you'd like to share. And now okay. we're... Sorry, I thought we had that set up here. Share. Okay. There we go. And then, pardon me, everybody. Now it's working. 
Okay, very good. Um, first of all, I want to say that I'm sorry we're not in person to do this presentation together and, and talk in person. So I want to tip my hat to Green Marine and say it's very important to continue to share this information and improve together. So thank you, Green Marine. Secondly, I'd like to say thank you to Pacific Coast Terminals to enable me to share this information with you today. My agenda today to speak with you is to talk about the team to make this project possible, project goals, the main message, which I'm not gonna hold from you to the bitter end. We're gonna share that with you right up front so we can pick that as we go forward. The planning and permitting to make this project happen um, talk about the construction and operations summary, operations, environmental monitoring and management, post dredge monitoring, fact check and closing thoughts. So this is an excellent segue, I think, from the previous presentation from Manel looking at um, a port perspective. This is more, if you want to call it an acute episode of dredging and marine construction and following the same theme of sustainable development. The team was quite diverse, uh, PCT being the proponent, being involved in every stage from permitting through financial planning. Envirochem and EnviroWest worked together for planning with regulators right through with First Nations consultation in every aspect of field and operational planning and monitoring. Seabulk Engineering was involved in berm designing and um, dredge planning. FRPD was the contractor for both building the submarine berm and the dredge operator. And lastly, we had excellent relationships with First Nations in terms of planning, getting input, and also um, engaging in the operations monitoring. That included locally, for those that know the Vancouver area, the Slavitooth, the Squamish, who unfortunately couldn't make it um, on site, but engaged in planning and permitting, and the Musqueam First Nation. So project goals, uh, the main point here is to reduce tidal dependence uh, for marine carriers to and from the PCT bursts, essentially to improve uh, operational efficiency. For our discussion today, the concept is uh, the, the mission impossible. Is it possible to dredge and restore marine habitat at the same time? To do that, we look at the three pillars of uh, sustainability, uh, sustainability envir and envir environment, social aspects, and economic variables. At the most general level, we're looking at, is there an ability to restore marine habitat while minimizing impacts? Looking at the economy, can we sustain and increase the viability of PCT with improved marine carrier traffic? and socially to minimize the nuisance while operating and obviously avoid that with the final alignment and then foster partnerships, particularly with First Nations. So instead of leaving this to the end, what I want you to think about as we go through this is the main message is to rethink waste. Um, waste perhaps has become a lost term in 10 or 20 years as we come to think of things more as a valued resource. So why rethink waste? Well, of course, it's an important green marine indicator. And then the second part is when you get into it, what is the second secondary value or purpose on or off site? In this case, we're gonna be talking about over 400,000 cubic meters of silty sediment. You go, what can I do with that? So we gave some thoughts that um, in our case, but in your case, I recognize that you don't have the same physical conditions as we have here on the coast, but perhaps there's other marine works um, that can use the material either for erosion, uh, protection, or even upland. There's, um, there's increasing exchange of materials that can be used upland based on the physical and chemical characteristics of the sediment. So where is this project taking place? Um, not everybody's been out to Vancouver, but if you jump on a plane and then we're gonna transit to Port Moody, um, you say, okay, I've been out here. What's common to a lot of people are known as Stanley Park. And as you transit through the harbor, you go to the eastern terminus of Bird and Let the Sea with she, and you wind up at Port Moody. And this is what it looks like a little bit closer. You basically have uh, the burst up here in the north part coming down to the active part of the site, including tankage for their liquids portion of the work. 
surrounded by uh, tidal mud flats, people who live on the waterfront and active waterfront industry, including sawmills. So what's the main question we attack this with? What makes sense? Do you take this material, turn left, head west, go through the inner harbor, transit a few hundred times, 35 kilometers out to a um, environment climate change permit disposal site at Point Grey, or do we keep the material local? And at the greatest distance, it's two and a half kilometers. So we started to explore the local placement option. What does that look like at a general level? Well, the material stays in Port Moody Arm. You get an option to explore habitat restoration. It's relatively cost effective, shorter duration of works, less GHGs and emissions, and you get to divert waste. Ocean, ocean dumping, it's convenient. In this case, materials transported to Point Grey, as we saw, there is no option for habitat restoration. We're forecasting a higher cost extended duration, substantially higher emissions, and no waste diversion. What does this look like in a little bit more detail? So if you look at the project duration, we see 69 days was our forecast, and it's roughly a third or a quarter of using two other types of equipment, clamshell for mechanical dredging, and then having to um, tug flat scows out to Point Grey, or in another case, using a closed hopper, which is a large vessel with a ship hold holding about 4,500 cubic meters of silt and water. Highly inefficient because it would be about 20% efficient. Most of it would be water, 20% solids. On the environmental side, you look at habitat enhancement and restoration, keep it local. You got an opportunity to make that work. Nothing for disposal at sea at depth. Air emissions, we are forecasting a half to roughly a quarter of GHGs and other emissions. And then obviously related to habitat restoration, using some of that material for waste diversion. Neither would be available if you went out to Point Grey. Economically, from a cost perspective, it's going to be most cost effective to keep it local versus transiting out again to Point Grey um, using this type of equipment more expensive than keeping it local, vastly more expensive going out to disposal at sea with the closed hopper. And it makes sense that if you have 69 days being a third or a quarter in duration, you'd expect less nuisance, light, noise, visual intrusion. And then finally, you would not get, this is not completely true, this one it is, but we're factually correct, here we get the opportunity to monitor both the operation to collect the sediment and dispose it locally. Here you only get to um, monitor locally with First Nations and develop that capacity lo um, locally but not disposal at Point Grey. With that in mind then we advance into a more detailed planning. What are we actually doing? So I showed, this is the outline of the plan dredge, which is, this is a nav channel, which is about 150 meters wide at its greatest width, about here, about 2.3 kilometers from the most western element to the tip of the turning basins where the vessels will turn around and nose into the burst and head northward. Here's the containment facility. This project is basically a continuance of what happened in 1995 where they built a berm along here, which became common with the new one that we built. And here is a, um, an elevation of four and a half meters chart. And we built up the berm, the new one here, outlined in yellow and intersected again with another contour at four and a half meters of the shoreline. And this is the idea is that we're able to build that up to four and a half meters and that elevation was chosen both for safety of navigation and to increase for photic zone, photic zone um, intrusion into the water into the water column and inspire and encourage growth of microalgae, eelgrass, etc. The, the the idea here was that the depth was too shallow and take it from an average of about minus 10.5 
chart datum to 14 meters, so about a three and a half meter cut. We're planning 550,000 cubic meters to go between this existing basin, which had about room for 50,000 cubes, and another 550 over here. So overall, we had room for just over 600, 610. And the last element you can see here in the red is a special area at the steep or deepest part of our containment facility, where we would take um, polycy polycyclic amer um, aromatic hydrocarbons from an area over here at prohibitive cost of going upland, we were able to prove that it would not be toxic to transit and put this material at depth and then cover it with the sediment that's obtained from dredging the channel and turning base. Permitting was extensive. We went through the presiding authority as Vancouver Fraser Port to get the project permit. The right to dredge was issued by Environment and Climate Change Canada. Fisheries and Oceans Canada provides the, provided the letter of advice which proved that there would be or advocated that there be no um, harm to fish. And then last is the Transport Canada uh, for the right to operate in that given area and make sure that the alignment would not impede uh, navigation. So the total permitting period elapsed was seven years. Plus a five year period for post dredge monitoring. It's 12 years minimum commitment, so it's not hard. Getting into sediment and habitat analysis, very briefly, we did a lot of sampling in the navigation channel. These colors here represent samples that were taken by core and ponar on the surface, and the core at various depths um, down to two meters, three meters actually, and which is the bottom of the core, which we give both um, uh, older um, sediment characterization as well as on the surface with the ponar. Over 120 samples were collected. Both sediment chemistry and toxicity sample or analysis were conducted. And at the end of the day, it was, the material was deemed suitable for disposal at sea at a new disposal location. Not at Point Grey, but at Point uh, Port Moody. Over here, we're looking at the habitat analysis, this was done in 2020. And basically we looked at benthos here, roughly you have two transects, one here, one here, we extrapolate as the second one. And you find a variety of benthic uh, organisms, polychaetes, clams, conical snails. There's a low anthropod population. Uh, Dungeness crab, quite common along this or original um, uh, perm structure here from 1995 and very little to no eelgrass. So before doing the work as part of the um, Environment Canada permitting, we had to look at the uh, sensitive receptors as well as some turbidity modeling, which I'll get to shortly. Very briefly, here is again the outline of the navigation channel and turning basin in the red. And over here shaded is where we have the disposal area. Pacific Coast Terminal is surrounded by mud, uh, mud flats, intertidal mud flats, as mentioned before, and many fish bearing streams. As well as there's physical assets owned by others, these two red stipple lines uh, represent um, submarine pipelines from imperial oil that were actually fallowed or in, inoperable since 1935 and had been cleaned, but unfortunately they're at an elevation where if they weren't taken out in advance of our dredge, we would actually hit the pipelines. So we had to do a lot of communication and planning with Imperial to get those out of the way before we started. From a recreational perspective, we have a marina here. And interestingly, where this green star is, was the former UBC uh, Open Water Research Institute, which had, um, I believe, four or five stellar sea lions, which were vulnerable to the noise of the dredgers as well as any turbidity. So I'm glad to report early on that there were no impacts um, experience there. From a turbidity modeling or forecasting perspective, what we're trying to do is work the operations to keep turbidity from operating equipment local. And our forecast and the main parts of equipment, which I'll show you briefly, the main bit of equipment is a cutter suction, which is a giant vacuum and floating pipeline. 
with a diffuser for discharge. Our forecast proved that within 300 meters linearly from either th side of the containment structure that we'd be able to meet the um, CCME water quality objectives for aquatic protection uh, aquatic life. So then we had to go and prove that. Here are the three bits or parts of equipment that we use to do the project. We have the clamshell here, which was used for berm construction, and then also for precision dredging near the burst and for removing and then placing uh, for mechanical disposal within the berm. This is the cutter section. Many people have not seen this. As I said, it's mostly like a, a giant vacuum, which you can see is floating pipelines here discharging after about a kilometer and a half uh, through a controlled discharge point through a diffuser onto the seabed. The third part of equipment that we're planning for that would be starting just on the west side for the first 600 meters next to the marina is the 309, which is a uh, trailing suction hopper and inside the vessel hold is 4,500 cubic meters for sediment. Unfortunately, when we started, it, within two hours, we determined that the hydrogen sulfide levels were unsafe for operation. That was terminated immediately due to safety. Came back to the 309, which was still operating. This was a test. This was operating. Then under um, permit amendment, we used submerged pipelines to go back to go to the western extent of the project area. So everything worked out. You know. So. Let's advance to the containment berm construction. Best laid plans, our original alignment came a little bit further west. If you recall, the turning basin has a semicircular structure here. We're right beside it within 60 meters. Best laid plans, we start putting down some of the, the rock and it disappears. So the substrate was too soft despite doing over here some cone penetration testing, went back to the drawing board, did more penetration tests, came up with a new alignment in the green. And this here is the new alignment, and this is the common berm from the 1995 structure, and then intersecting with the four and a half meter contour at shore, and then coming back along the intersecting. So this is the new alignment here. This is an image here replacing the material and that took approximately six weeks. The sequence of operations started, as I mentioned, with the PAH and using a clamshell to both retrieve and deposit at depth. The clamshell was used again at the birth face. They like to work on the rainbow skies. And then the last part is uh, the cutter suction. So here you can see up the stern and the pipes leading away through a diffuser. And this image here is to show you, this is the original uh, berm wall. This is the new one. And this is a, a rendering through a multi-beam image. Here's the new structure as we speak. And this grid here indicates where we placed the diffuser within containment. And here we had setbacks to prevent any material loss in the water column beyond containment to the best of our ability. So now we get into operations monitoring. This is a busy screen, so please stay with me. The operational area here, this is a containment structure. We had five transects, 100 meters, three times at various depths from the surface down to five meters to try and track uh, the mobile phase of turbidity, at what depth, what's happening based on where that um, diffuser is operating. Here you can see this is the inset map of the turning basin and here's the disposal area. In this operational area, operational area we looked at both turbidity and TSS. And we also covered the same in five locations near shore within the, the, the closed end of the um, Burrard Inlet Arm, or Port Moody Arm, pardon me. We also looked at particle size distribution, sedimentation using plates and aerial abundance and diversity. So these five were looked at in these locations, turbidity and TSS daily in the operational area, 
monitoring was done here twice a week. As you can imagine, when you're disturbing the seabed, you have to understand the behavior, the, the physical properties of the material. The bulking factor was calculated in advance by seabulk engineering, and it's basically the ratio of disturbed versus in situ sediment. As you can well imagine, it's affected by the physical properties I mentioned, and of course, production. As it turns out, the plan was to work 24-7 and we work less than that. So our, our overtopping of the berm due to the bulking factor was, in our opinion, was non-existent. What turned out to be, uh, in our opinion, was compliance with the water quality objectives of 8 NTU, 25 milligrams per liter, 100% of the time with, the only exception of mother nature. As I mentioned, there's a lot of creeks and when we have a couple of storms, we were able to differentiate between what kind of turbidity was being generated by the operation and what was happening naturally. Uh, Andrew, um, yes. just to let you know that normally there, your time is up. We're gonna have to move on to the uh, question and answer period. Uh, if you can please conclude. However, we don't have any questions yet in the Q&A section, but uh, maybe one more minute to conclude. Okay, so thank you for that. Yes, so we had many sampling locations, over 33 of them to look at benthic and chemical analysis. What we found is that in the sediment chemistry, everything was compliant with disposal at sea with the exception of a few inorganic exceedances which mimic natural background levels. And we said in the end, it's what we know now, the interim results is it's bioblocks or recolonization. And the benthic analysis is that there's a lot of the new Taxa, not new taxa, but a number of new organisms has gone up substantially from 2012 to 2020. So what do we have for a fact check? We have a much smaller area in terms of footprint for the new berm area, 11% smaller. Dredge volume area, 10% smaller. And then the dredge volume was 24% less. We were able to do this within the planned time allotment we think that we're on target for habitat enhancement and restoration at lower GHGs. We're able to do it within cost and reduce and elim not eliminate, but really reduce the number of, of uh, complaints. So overall, again, to rethink waste and think about spoils becoming a valued resource. We can still meet operational goals at lesser comparable cost and still go ahead and meet um, your, your plans for habitat restoration with lower reductions, of course, while your green moon verifiers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so we don't have any questions in the Q&A box for now, and it's already almost uh, three o'clock. So if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate. Uh, to uh, put them in the Q&A section and uh, sorry yeah, in the Q&A box and now I will introduce you all to our last speakers for today. It's going to be a joint presentation given by Michael Pucci from DP World and uh, Jason Shear from Prince Rupert Port Authority. So um, Michael from uh, Michael Pucci from DP World Prince Rupert is the manager of administration uh, of administ administration services at DP World Prince Rupert. He is responsible for implementing the Green Marine program as well as establishing innovative community partnerships. And Jason Shear from Prince Rupert Port Authority, uh, with more than 20 years of experience in fisheries and environmental management, Jason has been responsible for the development and implementation of the Environmental Sustainability Plan and various monitoring programs and initiatives at the Port of Prince Rupert. He holds a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Victoria and has several, uh, sorry, sorry, he has served as the president of the Prince Rupert and District Chamber of Commerce. So their presentation for today is entitled Innovative Industry and Port Authority Collaborations. So I think that um, Michael is yeah, doing uh, the, the, the presentation or Jason. <laughs> No, uh, uh, merci, uh, bonjour. Uh, thank you and, uh, and uh, welcome to uh, the north coast of uh, British Columbia. 
Um, basically, our, uh, our presentation, Innovati Innovative Environmental Partnerships and Collaboration, is really, even our presentation is a collaboration. So uh, I'll do a bit of an intro and, um, and then uh, hand it off to my good friend Jason, who will uh, lay the groundwork. And then I'd like to finish it off with a few stories from a uh, tenant point of view uh, and a major industry point of view um, within the uh, Prince Rupert Port Authority. Uh, Jason, can we have the next slide, please? Sorry, Mike, just turn it. Oh, here we go. There we go. So uh, what we have here is a wonderful, beautiful Prince Rupert. And uh, these two pictures were taken, uh, one from uh, just a few meters from my home and the other just a few meters from my office. And I think this really is a speaking point to uh, why um, we do what we do uh, on the environmental stewardship side. Um, these are, these are, are, are animals that uh, cohabitate our, our area and uh, I think it's very, very important. So um, without further ado, uh, Jason, next slide. I'd like to introduce uh, Jason from the Prince Report Authority, um, my landlord and also good friend and uh, investing in environmental science research and innovative programs through engagement collaboration at the Port of Prince Rupert. Jason. Thanks Mike for the intro. You know, as Mike stated, uh, Prince Rupert here is on the beautiful part of the Northern BC coast. And with future and current port activity, the Port Authority is committed to work with our partners to understand and protect the natural environment in which we operate. Uh, following the Green Marine philosophy going above and beyond regulation, the Port Authority as well as our industrial partners, including DP World, are providing leadership and supporting scientific research and monitoring programs. This is just a snapshot of our current list of participants, supporters, and partners here on the North Coast who we've worked with to date. Uh, and this Green Marine has really given us a, a very strong foundation in terms of working together uh, as a group of partners. Uh, you know, I'm glad I'm on a panel with Manon. Uh, you know, Green Marine has allowed several opportunities to engage with our other Port Authority partners uh, across North America. And so I've enjoyed many, many fruitful discussions with Manon over the last few years. Uh, Green Marine's also provided an opportunity to collaborate with shipping companies, which is, is, is a key for us moving forward with our environmental uh, programs. Uh, you know, our, our approach here at the Port Authority is a port-wide approach to environment and sustainability. And what we've done is uh, created a unique collaboration that brings together industry, First Nations, academics, NGOs, government agencies, and community, inclu and including some consultant experts to provide a forum for open and transparent dialogue and information sharing. And we think this is a real strength to what we've been doing here on the North Coast. Uh, it's important to know that this uh, table of partners looks to find areas to collaborate. And uh, I'll show you some examples of what's come from that. Uh, and also, you know, this collaboration's extended to some of the work that some of our government partners like DFO and TC are doing regards to their OPP initiatives. This is a quick summary of some of our environmental programs and uh, monitoring. And what we think we're doing here is, uh, or what we know is doing, we're doing is establishing a port environmental observatory. So this is a, a, a lengthy data set that we collect in partnership with others and share out uh, broadly uh, for use by, by anyone who is interested. It's important to know that these uh, funding uh, partnerships uh, that we've engaged upon Jason, Jason, you're frozen. Uh, we cannot really hear you. Man, if we uh, can't get Jason back, I can uh, step in from him for him if uh, you can hear me all right. 
what I'll do is, what I'll do, Mike, is I'll start sharing the presentation, uh, get to that slide, and you can pick up from there. Perfect. Thank you. You can go ahead. Uh, do, 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 do. So can I use you as the, uh, as the presenter, please? Yes. Thank you. So uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, I'll just uh, rehash what uh, Jason was mentioning on the 12 uh, uh, lengthy data sets. Um, they are uh, the fundamental basis for what we're, we're setting up as, as an observatory. Um, without participation from um, industry partners on some of these data sets, they would be done in a bit of a vacuum. And it's important to note that um, the tenants and, and this uh, port uh, environment uh, stewardship uh, committee is really, really um, the piece, the resistance against that observatory because it's, it's the guiding factor of legitimizing much like how uh, the uh, Green Marine works with not just industry, but NGO partners, things like that to legitimize our uh, indicators. We want this too to uh, be in that same fa uh, factor. So for instance, on the screen right now, Flora Bank Salmon Habitat Protection. Um, there was proposed LNG facility that was looking at Flora Bank based on uh, environmental as well as some social data that came out, uh, it was determined that it's best to be protected. And uh, that is something that has gone beyond just the protection, also a $1 million fund was set up by the Port Authority to uh, enhance and monitor salmon, hat, uh, salmon habitat uh, in uh, the Prince Rupert Port Authority waters. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Am I at the right slide? Yeah, yeah, please. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm changing slide. Can you see? No, it still says the floor bank. Okay. Okay. And uh, now I'm at the Skeena River Salmon and Ensign program. Uh, yeah. All right. No, uh, I still see the, uh, well, with the Skeena River Enhancement Program, that is similar uh, to the Floor Bank uh, project, where we see that the Skeena River feeds the, uh, the, the Prince Rupert Port Authority directly. And so the salmon habitat needs to be protected um, if we want any sort of credibility to be able to do industry. And so what the Port Authority is doing is, is not just taking the idea of social license and then putting uh, ribbons on things, they're actually setting up uh, science and research. And so where we're going with this whole concept is the, the Port Authority acts as the umbrella for science and research to really be uh, set up. And so they've gone on to now uh, establish uh, air quality, uh, water quality, and also uh, noise pollution monitoring stations, but they're not setting them up in, in areas that are, that are uh, just solely controlled by the Port Authority themselves. The tenants have offered it much like DP World. We have a noise monitor station on terminal. We have an air quality uh, station within a few meters of the terminal, as well as a water quality uh, station set up at the terminal. Um, for the Port Authority to do that uh, data. What can we keep? I come back. Oh, perfect. Okay. Wonderful. I'll just, just, I'll just finish the thought here. Yeah, the no, within, okay. or sorry, the key piece within this is that also DP World and the other tenants are also paying for these um, data sets in that um, we want them to be public. We want them to be endorsed by the tenants themselves so that the Port Authority can put out credible information along with the, uh, the researchers. Uh, Jason, take it away. Yeah, sorry about that. I've got an unstable internet connection here for the first time. Uh, Mike's talked about Floor Bank and a, a development moratorium that's been placed on it. 
Uh, we've contributed a hundred million, a million dollars towards a salmon enhancement program last year, or funding several programs uh, up to date. Uh, atmospheric science, a uh, long-term baseline that we've started in 2014 uh, as part of a program across North America. Mike's also mentioned this air quality station, uh, one of several. This one in particular is next to Mike's terminal. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, working with shipping partners, uh, recognizing accomplishments, and these, this is the Green Wave Award, which we uh, provided or, or um, gave out last year. Um, the 2019 winners are uh, BC Ferries, so a green, green member, as well as Costco, Maersk, Pacific Basin, and Ocean Network Express. We're also recognizing efforts that our shippers take in terms of underwater, uh, mitigating underwater noise. And last year, recognizing vessels that called from Pacific Basin and Maersk Line. We've been conducting an annual mission and GHD inventory over the last 10 years and using this data to develop a roadmap and a strategy. And from that data, we are committed to a 30% intensity reduction in GHD by 2030. Ocean graphic data plays an important role in terms of what we're collecting. Uh, this is ocean network, uh, o o ocean. Anyway, uh, this is a station that was deployed off of Atlin. Our water quality program uh, is a collaboration between uh, the port, some government agencies like the DFO, our First Nation partners are coming out sampling with us. Um, this is a long-term environmental baseline that our port tenants are now helping to fund, including DP World. This is a program for MotionWise called Pollution Tracker, setting ecosystem pollutants across the BC coast. This is some sampling we did a few years ago. Our aquatic invasive species program uh, has been ongoing for seven years now, working with partners like Metlakala, Lax Glams, and, and DFO. We've been working with our local college. Uh, there was a collaboration Mike might touch upon to provide some funds for a research vessel, providing our partners with these tools, and also investing in this next uh, generation of scientists through their applied ecology, a coastal ecology program. And we've been conducting biodiversity surveys across the area to understand our local ecosystem. Uh, you know, understanding what, what organisms live in the area and how best we maintain and protect these. And an important collaboration on the North Coast uh, that Michael touched upon is the North Coast Cetacean Research Initiative, working to understand marine mammals in the region. And these are the, uh, the, the team at OceanWise out uh, doing some uh, whale transects. An important part of our marine mammal program is, is engagement and uh, you know, sharing this knowledge with students. And this was a, a picture from our whale festival last year uh, that brought together the community. And uh, a partnership between ports over the last number of years uh, has developed both the Mariner's Guide for the Western Canada Coast and the Whale Port Alert System app, helping to provide real-time uh, um, sighting data to mariners on the coast. And I really believe this is a key to our success here on the North Coast is collaboration and working across uh, various partners and engaging the community and others in, in, in environment and stewardship. I just got to acknowledge the team I work with here at the port. Uh, you know, our programs wouldn't uh, be able to flourish uh, unless we had this dedicated team of, of knowledge experts. But it's also our port partners, which are really key to advancing our work here. And, um, you know, DP World is one of several. I just, you know, uh, I'm going to transition over to Mike, and this is a picture of us distributing some Mariner's guides a few years ago. 
So with that, Mike, I'll send it back to you. Thank you. Uh, so I, I just want to lay the groundwork for uh, the next kind of uh, part of the presentation, which is really about the innovative uh, stewardship uh, collaborations we've done. Uh, next slide, please, Jason. Uh, the terminal itself was opened in, in 2007, uh, uh, 207. Uh, um, but this is the key I want to really stress. We do about uh, one point, just over 1.1 million TEUs, uh, 20 foot equivalents uh, through the container terminal in a town of 13,000 for a population where the world's number one rail terminal as far as efficiency versus throughput. And we believe in true acknowledgement of the Coast Simpson and the Nine Allied Tribes. And uh, I really want to uh, lay down, again, I'm using this term uh, lay down because I, it's something that I truly believe in and something that DP World uh, believes in as well, is that we are sitting, the terminal itself is actually sitting on a village site. And it was a site of trade. And we are continuing that, that mission of trade. But we want not the term engagement. We really want uh, relationship and partnership and um, holistic vision. Uh, Jason, next slide, please. Because our leadership here in Prince Rupert is local. Uh, I'm, I grew up in, in Prince Rupert. My terminal manager grew up in Prince Rupert. And the philosophy of DP World itself is actually in the concessions that they hold, they want renewals. They don't go in for their 30 or 50 years and say they want to get out. Um, so we want to build tools for Prince Rupert because here in Prince Rupert of a town of 13,000, there's not a lot of cash that backs from the other industries. And so we could easily rely on the market share as DP World and the Port Authority to cloud communication, but rather we, we, we go on trust. And this led to that development of the, uh, the Port uh, Environment the Stewardship Committee and where the, the tenants NGOs environment. And the involvement where the Port Authority is, is that they have these, these uh, programs, mission inventory, traffic, we've Jason touched on many. And uh, DP World and, and through even compliance re, uh, re reasonings, you may as a terminal be developing your own similar things. But why? Why not go into the, the Port Authority version, make an overall uh, credible program so that you can communicate to the public effect effectively? Um, and this leads to this idea of co-development of lands and projects. DP World allows me uh, to provide significant portion of my time to go to other projects that have nothing to do with the terminal itself, but allow for me to, to input information for those groups to utilize our data or our understanding or how things work so that they have a more uh, realistic project and uh, development uh, timeline or uh, result. And lastly, this idea of the electrif electrification roadmap. And, and, Forgive me, I'm trying to go as quick as I can. I've only got a couple of minutes left. But realistically, that's where we want to go. The move off of uh, fossil fuels and DP World believes in that as well. So Jason, next slide, please. So if we want to get into electrification and, and state that we're going to get off of uh, fossil fuels, and again, it almost becomes a bit of a cliche, we do have to put our money where our mouth is. And, and again, the Port Authority provides an excellent opportunity to, to start that. But, you know, at, uh, DP World and, and again, other terminals, I'm sure are doing this, but we have to communicate and, and share these publicly is the travel tracking, develop the policy, communicate those policies, hard controls like the light management, mufflers and filters. Those things are not a uh, standard issue on these types of pieces of equipment. So if you gotta pay for those to go on top of, and we do. And then also this is something that's a bit controversial, but rapid depreciation. And the idea behind rapid depreciation is that our lifespan of vehicles and equipment is relatively short. Um, yes, that means we turn over our vehicles a lot more often, which is maybe not um, positive, but it allows for us to stay within our, our first line here, which is the written pro procurement policy of staying above tier four engines and allows us to start going into investment in pilots like electrification of the fleet, start stop technology, energy recoup, and then again, shore power, which I believe most people are, are familiar with. Next slide, please. So I'm going to skip over this slide, just next one, but really what the, the port, uh, Environmental Stewardship Committee is, is a SAR 
funder. And I don't mean search and rescue, I mean science and research. So we don't want to just fund apps. And, and one of these things, and I don't want to talk derogatory by anything, so apps are really important. But when we start talking about tracking uh, cetacean sightings, things like that, that's fantastic. But what we also want to do, and we found that was not happening from industry to research, is that we actually communicated that the vessels take a specific route. It's not, uh, you know, uh, as, as they choose. And so they were able to pinpoint and better utilize and become more effective their, um, A, the app, the, the monitoring, the data. And so it becomes a joint project in that we help legitimize the research in that we're sharing a lot of the data that we have on our side. Again, even the water quality, that goes out to the public. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Coast Mountain College, I want to share this story a little bit. Uh, Jason mentioned it. Coast Mountain College is a very, very small community college. Um, they had an opportunity to uh, get a vessel. It was not outfitted. And so DP World Port Authority and some other uh, uh, groups uh, were able to help outfit this research vessel. Um, so it can be used in the ecology program so we can develop the next generation of scientists, but also allows for other projects to happen like the bird cataloging, some of the evasive species data collection that's happening. And, but this is the key piece that I mentioned at the beginning, the tool uh, that creation for higher, uh, a for higher research vessel. Jason, next slide, please. And then lastly of my stories, um, this, this a woman that was part of the, the committee mentioned that she wanted to highlight the fact that there was a, a pod of whales that was coming into our harbor every year and it's been documented uh, year after year that this pod of whales was coming in and how she could do that. And I said right off the bat, right in the middle of the community is that DP World will put in the, the first part of money for this type of festival so that community could be aware. I had no idea and I don't think many people do. Um, so then it, it brought into the idea of not just a uh, notice and, and a highlight of education. There were speakers, scavenger hunt, visual, visual presentations, Sonic Seas, which uh, Green Tech uh, showed a couple years ago. But also there was development of a beer for the local brewery and food. So it, again, these collaborations can, can swell well beyond um, just keeping th something in-house. Jason, next slide, please. And then uh, the last of my stories is the, uh, the water quality uh, program. I keep mentioning this one, as I think it's really important that you know, when someone says that we are, uh, you know, or a group is, is we are behind the environment, we support the environment, you again have to show that information and, and create and saying, well, we've got these studies, but you, you leave them on your shelf, I don't think is appropriate. And so by partnering with the Port Authority, uh, along with the atmospheric uh, testing that goes on near the terminal, we're going out to the public with these reports. They become public uh, documents. And I think it's very, very important that uh, if we're proud of it, other people should be seeing it as well. And if we're not, we should then make the decision to fix it. And that's the best way to do is by putting it to the public. Next slide, please. And so lastly, as, as, I, as I end this, is, is that it's, more, it's, it's not compliance that DP World and these other tenants that are part of this committee uh, are participating in. It's our backyard. And it's about the information sharing, as I mentioned with the uh, 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 cetacean sighting thing about sharing the information of the, of the routes of vessels, things like that, building infrastructure, like with the vessel, um, leveraging funds, resources, relationship, like I mentioned with the uh, whale festival. And then it becomes providing and protecting local, but it, it's not always about the big picture, but it always ends up being a bigger piece to that big picture. And I think that to use the cliche, we're all related, six degrees of uh, Kevin Bacon, um, I think is really a true uh, statement here. And then uh, last slide here, uh, Jason. Um, I wanna thank everyone and I know I, I, uh, I rushed and so I'm open to uh, sit and answer some questions, but I really wanna say that um, in Prince Rupert, uh, the idea of sharing information, um, fostering relationships, uh, understanding our indigenous um, uh, ancestors uh, is really key to making sure that uh, Prince Rupert, which is 60 nautical miles from Alaska, uh, stays a success. And uh, this year we're projected to do 1.2 million uh, TEUs through the terminal. So, thank you. Well, thank you, Michael. And thank you, Jason, for this great presentation. Um, so uh, while people are, maybe attendees are writing questions in the Q&A box, I have a, another question for Andrew. 
Uh, if you can unmute yourself, Andrew. Uh, the question is, uh, dredging can sometimes be controversial with some groups, particularly wildlife groups. And I imagine in this area in BC, dredging is not hugely popular with, uh, let's say, the white sturgeon conservation groups. And we're wondering, uh, how would one go about sort of calming those initial worries within communities and eventually gardening the social license to dredge? In your experience, do you have any best practices or lessons learned that have led to positive outcomes? Great. Thank you for that question, and it's a good one. Dredging is controversial. Um, it has the potential and is known sometimes to affect everything from benthic organism, organisms, but even less so uh, by can to um, macro, including marine mammals. Um, I think with any project, you have to know the physical environment that you're working in, which puts an emphasis on inventory, water quality, the presence of fish, marine mammals, etc. Uh, we spent upwards of uh, six years, uh, various times, looking at uh, sediment chemical characterization, potential toxicity uh, to fish, as well as um, uh, I, our biologist knows that region for uh, intimately for over 25 years. So the inventory of fish and mammals and understanding what species habitate that area. Uh, white sturgeon, not common. That's typically an area um, uh, involvement in the Fraser River. So on the blind end of Port Moody on the Salish Sea, uh, there's no uh, sturgeon. Uh, I think once in over two or three decades, there may have been a verified uh, killer whale observation, very unique, as they tend to turn, if they do come into the Inner Harbor, go up towards Indian Arm. But to answer your question, to avoid the controversy, it requires a lot of uh, inventorying, as well as we prided ourselves getting out early and often um, probably could have been even more frequent in talking with First Nations, their understanding and knowledge as well as local groups. Yes, there's concern, but I think a healthy dose of consistent inventory as well as practices during operating constantly as monitors we were looking for marine wildlife as well as avians during that operational phase. We saw no consequences, no morbidity, no mortality, no floating fish, no impacts to avians, rookery there for uh, blue herons, no marine mammals impact. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. We did not see it, and that was our forecast. I hope that answered your question. And I'm available to talk to you anytime if you wish to call. Perfect. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and I would have one question for Michael and Jason. Uh, it's always great to hear about stakeholder partnerships, particularly when they're as successful as the one that you presented earlier. Uh, you mentioned that the key to success is collaboration. Can you speak a bit on that? Can you offer up uh, any lessons learned on uh, how other ports and tenants might develop similar strong relationships? What are the most important considerations early on when looking to establish relationships or collaborations like this? I, I would have to, so I, as, as someone who goes in for the collaboration, uh, I, I would say that the key um, is understanding the other party's point of view. Um, without, under, with, by you dictating, well, you can have the money if you do this, I don't think is a true collaboration. I think really what it is is that uh, you have to believe in the mission, you have to believe in the goal, and it will be, uh, pun intended because we're in the marine industry, a fluid um, way to get there. Um, and some of the examples I can give is, is very much so about the, um, the whale uh, festival. It started off with, we want to celebrate the whales uh, that come to our harbor. And I said, hey, that's fantastic. Let's do that. And let's get some information and education series uh, happening with the schools. And then again, it, it morphed into this idea of celebration um, with the beer. And like, that's fantastic. That's all good. But I still get as the piece that I thought as important. And, and again, the organizing committee uh, understood that is that I still believe education is, the, is a key component to it. And so what else happens along with it, um, as long as you're ethically uh, okay with I think is really important to accept 
Um, and I'll, I'll even use uh, some examples with our uh, Indigenous uh, relationships, is that, again, the where the um, cetacean um, program came from was there was a uh, LNG proponent that was doing engagement with um, the local uh, groups and found that uh, marine mammal uh, was an important piece. Um, that project, the LNG project, did not come to fruition, and the project, and then so hence the funding dried up. Um, DP World, Port Authority, and DFO still believes, and and again uh, to the initial comment that these are important pieces. So the Ocean Wise Group realized that they can still have and and have a, a great project, but we may have to alter it slightly to focus on um, not the tankers that are coming, but all traffic. And so that's why I commented and I didn't have the time to make uh, do, but the, the, the side information that came out about what wasn't known from the industry side, but the idea of like, well, the, the, the vessels take all the same route with a, with a Canadian pilot, BC Coast pilot on board, um, and they uh, are at this uh, speed as mandated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and even in the fuel usages and things like that. So there was a lot of uh, sub information that was that was passed on to help build an effective uh, model for, for the, the, the group. Thank you, Michael. Perfect. Uh, well, with all that, it's already almost uh, 3.30. So we need to conclude this uh, webinar session. Uh, I want to thank again all the speakers that have that did a presentation today. I want to thank again our sponsors and of course all of our attendees which make this uh, event uh, very interesting and useful. So uh, I encourage you to not miss our second September session of our virtual Green Tech web series which will be held on September 15th, September 15th next week. Uh, same time, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daytime, and uh, the topic will be communications, public perception, and community outreach at ports. Uh, and we invite you to visit our website for more information and to register, or to register, and don't hesitate to contact any uh, Green Marine staff uh, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions. So we thank you all for today, and we wish you all a uh, good afternoon. Thank you.